fireworks. Sophie breathed in awe. The Eiffel Tower lit up with a spectacular fireworks display. Blue and gold traceries of light raced them almost a thousand feet in the mass to the very top of the tower, where they blossomed into fountains of blue globes. Sparking, hissing, fizzing, rainbow-colored threads wove through the struts, bursting and snapping. The tower's thick rivets popped with white fire, while the arching spars rained cool ice-blue droplets into the street far below. The effect was dramatic, but it became truly spectacular when Saint Germain snapped the fingers of both hands and the entire Eiffel Tower turned bronze, then gold, then green, and finally blue in the morning sun. Rattling traceries of light darted up and down the metal. Catherine wheels and rockets, fountains and Roman candles, flying spinners and snakes spun off from every floor. The mass at the very tip of the tower fountained red, white, and blue sparks that cascaded like bubbling liquid down through the heart of the tower. The crowd was entranced. People gathered at the base, ooing and eyeing, applauding at each new explosion, their cameras clicking furiously. Motorists stopped on the roads and climbed out of their cars, holding camera phones to snap the stunning and beautiful images. Within moments, the dozens of people around the tower had grown to a hundred, and then, within a matter of minutes, had doubled, then doubled again, as people came running from shops and homes to observe the extraordinary display. And Nicolas Flamel and his companions were swallowed up by the crowd. In a rare display of emotion, Machiavelli hit the side of the car so hard it hurt his hand. He watched the growing crowd of people and knew his men would not be able to get through in time to prevent Flamel and the others from escaping. The other air sizzled and spat with fireworks. Rockets went whizzing high into the air, where they exploded into spheres and streamers of light. Firecrackers and sparklers rattled around each of the tower's four giant metal legs. Sir! A young policeman captain stopped before Machiavelli and saluted. What are your orders? We can push through the crowd, but there may be injuries. Machiavelli shook his head. No, don't, do not do that. D would do it, he knew. D would not hesitate to level the entire tower, killing hundreds just to capture Flamel. Drawing himself up to his full height, Niccolo could just about make out the shape of the leather-clad Saint Germain and the lethal scat thatch hurting the young man and woman away. They melted into the now huge crowd and disappeared. But surprisingly, shockingly, when he looked back, Nicholas Flamel remained where we had first seen him, standing almost directly beneath the center of the tower. Flamel raised his right hand in a mocking salute, the silver link bracelet he wore reflecting the light. Machiavelli caught the police captain's shoulder, spun him around with one surprising strength, and pointed with his long, narrow fingers. That one! If you do anything else today, get me that one! I now want him alive and unharmed! As they both watched, Flamel turned and hurried toward the west leg of the Eiffel Tower, toward the Pont de Aina. But whereas the others had run across the bridge, Flamel turned to the right, toward the Quai Branly. Yes, sir! The captain struck out at an angle, determined to cut off Flamel. Follow me! he shouted, and his troops spread out in a line behind him. Dagon stepped up to Machiavelli. Do you want me to track Saint Germain in the shadow? His head turned, nostrils flaring with a wet, sticky sound. I can follow their scent. Niccolo Machiavelli shook his head slightly as he climbed back into the car. You get us out of here before the press turns up. Saint Germain is nothing if not predictable. He's undoubtedly heading to one of his homes, and we have all of them under observation. All we can do now is hope they ca we capture Flamel. Dagon's face was impassive as he slammed the car door closed behind his master. He turned in the direction Flamel had run and saw him disappear amongst the crowd. The police were close behind, moving fast even though they were weighted down by their body armor and weapons. But Dagon knew that over the centuries, Flamel had escaped both human and inhuman hunters, had slipped past creatures that had been myth before the evolution of the apes, and had outwitted monsters that had no right to exist outside of nightmares. Dagon doubted that the police would catch the alchemist. Then he cocked his head, nostrils flaring again, catching the scent of Skatdach. The shadow had returned. The enmity between Dagon and the shadow went back millennia. He was the last of his kind because she had destroyed his entire race one terrible night 2,000 years ago. Behind his wraparound mirrored sunglasses, the creature's eyes filled with sticky, colorless tears, and he swore that no matter what happened between Machiavelli and Flamel, 
This time, he would have his revenge on the shadow. Walk, don't run, Skatatch commanded. Saint Germain, take the lead. Sophie and Joss in the middle. I'll take up the rear. Scatty's tone left no room for argument. They darted across the bridge and turned right onto the Avenue de New York. A series of lefts and rights brought them to a narrow side street. It was still early and the street was entirely in shadow. The temperature dropped dramatically and the twins immediately noticed that the fingers of St. Germain's left hand, which were gently brushing against the dirty wall, left tiny sparks in their wake. Sophie frowned, sorting through her memories. The Witch of Endor's memories, she reminded herself, of the Comte de St. Germain. She caught her brother looking sidelong at her and raised her eyebrows in a silent question. Your eyes turned silver, just for a second he said. Sophie glanced over her shoulder to where Scatthatch was trailing behind, then looked at the man in the leather coat. They were both out of earshot, she thought. I was trying to remember what I knew. She shook her head. What the witch knew about Saint Germain? What about him? I've never heard of him. He's a famous French alchemist, she whispered, and along with Flamel, probably one of the most mysterious men in history. Is he human? Josh wondered aloud, but Sophie pressed on. He's not elder or next generation, he's human. Even the Witch of Endor didn't know a lot about him. She met him for the first time in London in 1740. She knew immediately he was an immortal human, and he claimed he discovered the secret of immortality when he was studying with Nicholas Flamel. She shook her head quickly. But I don't think the witch quite believed that. He told her that while traveling in Tibet, he had perfected a formula for immortality that didn't need to be renewed each month. But when she asked him for a copy, he told her he lost it. Apparently, he spoke every language in the world fluently, was a brilliant musician, and had a reputation as a jewel maker. Her eyes blinked silver again as the memories faded. And the witch didn't like or trust him. Then neither should we, Josh whispered urgently. Sophie nodded agreeing. But Nicholas likes him and he obviously trusts him, she said slowly. Why is that? Josh's expression was grim. I've told you before, I don't think we should be trusting Nicholas Flamel either. Something's not right about him, I'm convinced. Sophie bit back her response and looked away. She knew why Josh was angry with the alchemist. Her brother was envious of her awakened powers, and she knew he blamed Flamel for putting her in danger. But that didn't mean he was wrong. The narrow side street led onto a broad tree-lined avenue. Although it was still too early for rush hour, the spectacular light and fireworks display around the Eiffel Tower had brought any traffic in the area to a standstill. The air was filled with the blare of car horns and the whooping of police sirens. A fire truck was caught in the traffic jam, its wails rising and falling, though there was nowhere for it to go. Saint Germain strode across the road, looking neither left nor right as he dug into his pocket for a slender black cell phone. He flipped it open and hit speed dial. Then he spoke in rapid fire French. Are you calling for help? Sophie asked when he had closed the phone. St. Germain shook his head. Ordering breakfast, I'm famished. He jerked his thumb back in the direction of the Eiffel Tower, which was still erupting fireworks. Creating something like that, if you'll pardon the pun, and burns a lot of calories. Sophie nodded, understanding now why her stomach had been rumbling with hunger since she had created the fog. Skatthatch caught up with the twins and fell into step alongside Sophie as they hurried past the American Cathedral. I don't think we're being followed. She said, sounding surprised. I would have expected Machiavelli to send someone after us. She rubbed the edge of her thumb against her bottom lip, chewing on her ragged nails. Sophie automatically brushed Scatty's hand away from her mouth. Don't bite your nails. Skatthatch blinked at her in surprise, then self-consciously put her hand down. An old habit, she muttered. A very old habit. What happens now? Josh asked. We get off the streets and rest, Skatthatch said. Have we much farther to go? She called out to St. Germain, who was still in the lead. A few minutes, he said without turning around. One of my smaller townhouses is nearby. Skatthatch nodded. Once we get there, we'll lie low until Nicholas returns. Get some rest and a change of clothes. She wrinkled her nose in Josh's direction. And a shower too, she added significantly. Color touched the young man's cheeks. Are you saying I smell? He asked, both embarrassed and angry. Sophie laid her hand on her brother's arm before the warrior could answer. Just a little, she said. We probably all do. Josh looked away, clearly upset, then glanced back at Skatthatch. I don't suppose you smell, he snapped. Nope, no sweat glands, she said. The vampire are a much more evolved species than the human eye. 
They continued in silence until the Rue Pierre Charond opened up out into the broad Champs d'Elysees, Paris's main thoroughfare. To their left, they could see the Arc de Triomphe. Traffic on both sides of the street was stopped, with drivers standing alongside their cars chatting animatedly, gesticulating wildly. All eyes were turned to the rippling fireworks still exploding over the Eiffel Tower. How do you think this would be reported on the news? Josh asked. The Eiffel Tower suddenly erupting in fireworks? St. Germain glanced over his shoulder. Truth is, it's not that out of the ordinary. Towers often lit up with fireworks. New Year's Eve, Bastille Day, you know, for example. I would imagine it would be reported that next month's Bastille Day fireworks went off prematurely. He stopped and looked around, hearing someone call out his name. Don't look, Scotty began, but it was too late. The twins in St. Germain had turned in the direction of the shouts. Germain! Hey, Germain! Two young men were standing next to their unmoving car were pointing at St. Germain and shouting his name. Both men were dressed in jeans and t-shirts and looked alike, with slicked back hair and over large sunglasses. Abandoning their car in the middle of the road, they wove through the stalled traffic, both holding what Josh thought looked like long, narrow blades in their hands. Francis, Skatich warned urgently, her hands locking into fists. She moved forward just as the first man reached St. Germain. Let's me... Gentlemen, St. Germain turned toward the two men, smiling widely, though the twins, who were behind him, saw yellow-blue flames dance across his fingertips. Oh, great concert last night, the first man said breathlessly, speaking English with a strong German accent. He pushed back his sunglasses and held out his right hand, and just realized that what he had first imagined was a knife was nothing more than a fat pen. Any chance I could get an autograph? The flames on St. Germain's fingers winked out. Of course, he said, smiling delightedly, reaching for the pen and pulling a spiral-bound notebook from the inner pocket. Did you get a new CD? He asked, flipping open the notebook. The second man, wearing identical glasses, plucked a black and red iPod from the back pocket of his jeans. Got it on iTunes yesterday, he answered in the same distinctive accent. And don't forget to check out the DVD of the show when it comes out in a month's time. Got great extras, a couple of remixes, and a great mashup. St. Germain added as he signaled his name with an elaborate flourish and pulled the pages from the notebook. I'd love to chat, guys, but I'm in a rush. Thanks for stopping. I appreciate it. They shook hands quickly and the two men hurried back to their car, high-fiving one another as they compared their autographs. Smiling broadly, St. Germain took a deep breath and turned to look at the twins. Told you I was famous. And you'll soon be dead famous if you don't get off this street, Skatach reminded him. Or maybe just dead? We're just here, St. Germain murmured. He led them across the champs Elysees and down a side street, then ducked into a narrow, high-walled, cobbled lane that snaked along the backs of the buildings. Slipping halfway down the alley, he slid a key into an anonymous-looking door set flush with the wall. The wooden door was chipped and scarred, foul green paint peeling in long strips to reveal blistered wood beneath. The bottom was splintered and cracked from rubbing the ground. May I suggest a new gate? Skatach said. This is the new gate, St. Germain smiled quickly. The wood is just a disguise, but beneath it is a slab of solid steel with a five-point deadbolt. He stepped back and allowed the twins to precede him through the entrance. Enter freely and of your own will, he said formally. The twins stepped forward and were vaguely disappointed with what they found. Behind the gate was a small courtyard and a four-story building. To left and right, tall spike-tipped walls separated the house from its neighbors. Sophie and Josh had been expecting something exotic or even dramatic, but all they saw was an unkept leaf-strewn rear garden. A huge and hideous stone birdbath was set in the center of the courtyard, but instead of water, the bowl was filled with dead leaves and the remains of a bird's nest. All the plants in the pots and baskets surrounding the fountain at its center were dead or dying. The gardener's away, St. Germain said without a trace of embarrassment. And I'm not really good with plants. He held up his right hand and spread his fingers. Each one popped a light with a different colored flame. He grinned and the colored flames painted his face in flickering shadows. Not my specialty. Skatach paused by the gate, looking up and down the alleyway, head tilted to one side, listening. When she was satisfied they were not being followed, she closed the door and turned the key in the lock. The deadbolt slid into place with a satisfying thunk. How will Flamel find us? Josh asked. Even though he was wary and fearful of the alchemist, he felt even more nervous around St. Germain. I gave him a little guide, St. Germain explained. Will he be all right? Sophie asked Skatach. I'm sure he will be, 
she said, though the tone of her voice and the look in her eyes betrayed her fears. She was turning away from the gate when she stiffened, jaw unhinging, vampire titties suddenly, terrifyingly visible. The door to the rear of the house had opened suddenly, and a figure stepped out into the courtyard. Abruptly, Sophie's aura blazed silver white, the shock sending her spinning back into her brother, bringing his aura to crackling life as well, outlining his body in gold and bronze. And as the twins held on to one another, blinded by the silver and gold light of their own auras, they heard Skat that scream. It was the most terrifying sound they had ever heard.